Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to the 40 Orty podcast. How are you doing today? We're back up to the sunny skies. Today, we are talking about autism and OCD. So this individual I met doing sort of like a BBC uh, Radio Manchester video. We did it at my taekwondo club, I think in Rochdale. And there was this lady who I sort of got in contact with called Louise Crooms, who is sort of like an openly autistic BBC freelancer. And one of her co-workers was Nick Ransom. And today, Nick Ransom is our guest. How are you doing? Hi. Yeah, very good. Um, great to be on, on the podcast at last. I know, right? Mm. And we've, we've met quite a, a few times in the past. Um, firstly, to do sort of the BBC video and then, of course, the um, documentary interview. I think we also we also met up a few times just as like a I think it was like your birthday or something. Yes, it was. Yeah, my my birthday last year. Yeah, yeah. Well, there have been a few times. Played actually, some fibbage. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> it was an interesting night. That <laughs> it was really good. I I really enjoyed it. Mm. So yeah, would you like to give everyone a little bit of an introduction into who you are and what you do? Uh, yeah. So um, as as you know, I'm Nick, and um, I. Uh, currently work for the BBC at the moment. Um, I'm currently working for uh, BBC Bite Size Daily, which is the uh, educational service at the BBC at the moment. Obviously, with the lockdown and everything like that, st- students across the UK still need uh, educating. So um, I was initially part of Bite Size for kind of the back end of, of December and, and then kind of continued into the year. And then obviously when you know the, the virus hit, then kind of got encouraged to, to come in and, and join the, the team on, on the daily programme. So so currently, I'm I'm kind of I'm mixing uh, kind of video editing with sort of graphic design work and kind of organising clips and and just making sure that the content goes to the to the editors essentially. Uh, previously, I've worked on uh, a question of sport and uh, children need, and uh, I met you, Tom, obviously at uh, Radio Manchester, where I was a, a journalist mm-hmm. for uh, a digital journalist for a few months. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm very lucky to have, have got to my kind of goal really, which was to always work for. Uh, a big uh, media organisation, and uh, I'm lucky to have finally got to where I want to be. I guess continue making programmes and continue meeting different people, and yeah, that's that's kind of what I've, I'm doing at the moment. It's very cool, and it's it's definitely not a job that is readily available to people. Mm. I think it's um, it's definitely mm. quite an interesting job role to have. I think, especially like I mean, media is is a very difficult industry to to get into, and I think. Um, one of the the things that makes it hard, especially for autistic people, is the sense that um, you know jobs. It's not you can't just apply for a job in in the media industry. There's, it's all about connections. It's all about chatting to people and meeting people. And and that's yes. something I still still don't think I'm a hundred percent great at doing. To be honest, I, I kind <laughs> of throw myself into it to try and yeah chat to people. But it's you know you do I do find myself having a tendency to go on the web and just search for. For, for jobs in, in the industry, which I know don't really exist. It's kind of, I mean, there's some of them do, and some of them are advertised on Facebook groups and, and whatever, but it's it's more of an industry where, yeah, you've got to have a nice book of contacts. And um, yeah, I suppose to some degree that kind of, you know, discriminates those who are perhaps, um, you know, socially disabled, should we say. So, or disadvantaged, yeah. Yeah. And um, I do remember sort of with our longer form interview, mm. I think you mentioned something about you, you started YouTube um, in your secondary school and mm. you sort of took a shine to the, the whole media world. Yeah, it's it's funny. I, can, I mean, I can only ever remember, um, you know, when people would talk about what you want to do in the future. Even when I was like six or seven or something like that, I'd be walking around with a microphone and talking yeah. into it or, you know, something like that. And eventually, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I gravitated towards YouTube and that was starting to grow. And I did a little kind of web show it was at the time. and 
yeah, a lot of it's still online. So I mean, it's it's very embarrassing <laughs> to look back on now. But um, now, obviously, it's part it's part of the journey. Got to start um, somewhere. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, ever since I've um, yeah kind of had that that discussion of do I go to university? It was it was kind of always going to be television and always going to be somewhere and, and Media City, which is you know a, a real hub of media these days, is is kind of it's amazing. Where, yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? It's where it's all at. You know, it's like media the actual Media City building seems like some strange sort of tech um utopian tech future it's it's it is a bit crazy especially yeah. like with all the levels and all the this the building structure and all the rooms where people record and stuff it's yeah. it's a very surreal place to go yeah. to especially i think you know especially if you're studying at that university and, and you, you know you you just see the outside of these walls and you just think what what's in there and what goes on in there and what conversations go on in there and <laughs> to finally to finally kind of end up in those yeah in those walls um being people that that make make decisions or make some decisions is 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 incredible really so um yeah obviously working from home at the moment so i do miss miss the uh, the beauty of the bbc a bit but um yeah it's uh it's an incredible place to be and the, you know the technology and the the infrastructure they've got there is just is world class and and be a part of that is is an honor really so just for the listeners out there as i've said this isn't this definitely isn't the first type of content both myself and nick have made mm. or collaborated on we did the bbc radio manchester video then the documentary mm. now a podcast of course <laughs> yeah we've done the whole set what was the filming process like for you i know it was a little bit of a short sort of thing but mm. did you enjoy it yeah it was um yeah, I mean, it's funny because yeah, I've always been been one very open and honest, as obviously autistic people uh, generally are. And um, yeah, I've never usually had a kind of problem talking away about myself. <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> yeah, it was it was good to to get it all out. I mean, it was such a, it feels like years ago now. But um, yeah, it's it was uh, at least a year ago, definitely. Yeah, but you know, I think it's it's great that autistic people get a you know have have be are able to now have a voice and able to to talk about it and post their own content and. Um, you know, I did, I did a video when I, I came out of, you know, when, once I just had my diagnosis and the, the kind of self-confidence it brings you by doing a, a YouTube um, video or, or a documentary like you did is, um, is very important. So I think, uh, yeah, it was, um, it was good to be a part of. And yeah, I saw, um, you know, it's, it's, you've got a nice balance of, um, of people in really. So um, it's, 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 it's difficult to often describe what autism is or what, what autistic yes. people are like. But I think, um, mm -hmm. yeah, just variety and trying to, capture a range is, is important yeah i invited both you and adam i think because I'm, I'm friends with adam and I've, I've had him on the podcast but like sort of the other people that came along were surprisingly very 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 different from each other yeah it was it it did sort of quite astound me at the sort of range of of personalities and opinions that that were there and even even experiences to some degree and it was it was quite sort of humbling to listen to people's stories. I, I suppose that's one of the reasons why I wanted to put more into the podcast because I like talking to people about stuff mm. like this. It's yeah, I mean, I think I, I think that's one of the most um, fascinating things, you know, not just in my world, but but generally is is just you know finding out about autism. And, and even if I wasn't autistic, I think I'd be really fascinated by it. And um, yeah, the the, the amount of depth and um an interest you you kind of uh you know the interest that the autistic people have is just is phenomenal really so i think um yeah the more the more we share their stories uh, or our stories i should say that the better really <laughs> definitely going on to talking about you again what is your experience with autism when were you diagnosed and what sort of impact did that diagnosis have on your life mm. yeah i mean uh, it was a it was a situation where um yeah at home uh when i was younger at school and stuff i'd, I'd be i'd be fine at home uh, sorry i'd be fine at school i'd be um you know i'd crack on with my lessons and i'd i'd, I'd be fine learning and, and that would be okay and then at home i'd just kind of come home and yeah tear the house apart really and um yeah i don't know i think in terms of anxiety yeah just kind of letting all my frustrations out on my parents who you know did an incredible job put, putting up with me you know and um yeah i think i just you know i'd have tantrums and i'd you know I'd, terribly be, you know be, behaved kid and um but m my parents couldn't figure it out because you know at school I was you know I was coping and I, I put all my efforts into kind of making it through the school the school day and trying mm -hmm. not to 
you know kind of crack under under learning and you know the socialization of everything and um i think i just thought you know it's just just who i am i'm just i, I didn't think probably think too much about it i just think i enjoyed school and at home i just found life more stressful and i don't know why i think it's because perhaps at school i th- i thought that life should be stressful and it kind of it wasn't and then at home when you know you're supposed to be kind of relaxing and you're supposed to be kind of chilled i'd kind of you know let small things get to me and i think that's something yeah. that happens um even more now i'm more comfortable in a work environment i'm always i'm happy i'm happier when i'm being productive really whereas at home where you're supposed to be you know chilling and relaxing and stuff i'm not i'm not very good at it so no me neither <laughs> that's kind of <laughs> i know it it is a very sort of backwards way of of living really but um yeah so i think so what happened was yeah essentially at, at the end of my kind of teenage years um i was still kind of you know finding life domestically quite difficult and yeah I was kind of I think I don't know if I was at university yeah I think I was at university by this point kind of I'd done my first year and um yeah it'd been quite an intense first year with kind of parties and flatmates and whatever um and by the time it got to yeah getting on 19 I guess or something my my mum <laughs> went to the doctor and said um I mean obviously I've been at university for most of the year and then I've come home during the mm-hmm. summer or whatever um and she said you know I don't, I don't think, I'm not sure what, I can't put my finger on it, but my son's not acting like a normal 19 year old or whatever. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And, um, she, she told me this and I was like, right, I'll try not to be offended by that. I'll, I'll just kind of, you know, go with it. (laughs) And, um, yeah, it was, it was weird. So she, she, so I kind of, yeah, blanked it out and went, you know what, that's, that's her opinion. She can go and do what she likes. And I'm all very stubborn at this point. And, um, yeah. (laughs) And then I kind of, yeah, I think. Oh, yes, that was it. So a few months later, I went to um, Reading Pride because I, I tick all the diversity boxes, you see. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so I was with my, my then partner at the time. And there was about eight of us on this day, day out at this very sunny, loud music um, event, I guess. And yeah, there was just something inside of me that just kind of wasn't, that just didn't feel right. Like that the switch was some one switch wasn't on inside of me, it, it felt like. And uh I was driving home that day and I, I, I went, hmm, I wonder if there's anything in, because my mum had told me um, when she, she went to the doctors, um, it, it might be Asperger's or, um, or something like that. And, and I was like, hmm, maybe, maybe there is something in that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I ended up kind of getting home and Googling and doing my research. And yeah, within probably a few hours or a few days, it was, it was okay. I, you were right, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Um, yeah. This sounds like me. And then I was kind of as as obsessive as she was about figuring out, you know, a diagnosis and and finding some sort of, yeah, sense of it also. So yeah, I kind of went through my um, my GP and chatted to them about it, and yeah, I, I was it was quite a quick diagnosis, really, it was within about five months. And um, I was That's I was good. up here in, in in Chester, yeah, in Manchester. Um, so yeah, it was, it was very good. very quick. Yeah, a lot of people wait years, don't they? So. Yeah. yeah, I'm very lucky, very lucky to be able to have that. Um, but yeah, I went to Chester and my mum drove up from the south and uh, came came with me and um, I took a day out of, of uni to to go out and um, you know it was it was kind of a formality from then on really. Hmm. And I think um, one of one of the interviewees on on the documentary, Peter um, Bainbridge, did did say that like um, resistance to help and stuff usually happens between like our teenage and and adulthood and like even though i was diagnosed when i was 10 i was still very resistant to just how much autism was a part of me i sort of saw it as like an add-on thing and i sort of saw it as the the social difficulties and the sensory stuff and that's all it really was to me yeah but I'd, i'd seem to be getting on all right you know i had like a I had a girlfriend and I had some sort of loose friends around me. I never really had any, never really had much, much motivation to, to read into autism more. I just sort of went off what my mum told me when I was going through a bad patch. It's, it's hard to sort of get yourself to take it more seriously when it's, I found it some, for me, it was like an ego thing. Like I didn't want to be, a part of something I wanted to be just, just Tom, and mm. I'm a I'm a phenom- phenomena on its own rather than a gr- a group of people, I guess. 
Yeah, I, th- I think there's there's yeah a lot of truth in that in the sense that if you're told you're different from a very early age, that is that is often very difficult to accept. And um, I think there's there's got to be you know, and I'm sure there's research going into this all the time. But I think there's a an element of you've got to explain it in such a way that being different is is actually you know everyone wants to everyone is different in in some way. So I think it's um, yeah, it's trying trying to teach from a very early age that being different is not a not a bad thing. And I think that's yeah. You know, I was lucky to kind of have positive out of it, I guess. So, yeah, like there's there's one thing that I, I picked up on when you were, you know you were saying about sort of being fine at school and and not having too much stress and then going home. I was yeah. like, it's usually when people explain explain to me what school is like. It is it's usually the stress levels and the sensory stuff and the social stuff and and having to cope with that on sort of a long a long term basis during the school day and um, mm. sort of drains your energy so that yeah. when you come home and when you're in a safe environment that's when you dis- you you stop putting up those walls of trying to act composed and stuff and and so it sort yeah. of comes out in your emotions yeah. yeah 100% i think uh yeah it is it is strange i mean at school i was i was a very kind of you know i knew lots of people but the problem is i didn't have mm. many friends that was the thing lots of people knew <laughs> kind of what I did and you know what I was about with video and you know that kind of thing and so yeah yeah it's 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 a strange one like I felt like oh actually I, I'm quite well not popular but I felt like I kind of oh right people know me kind of thing which is cool but then after a while yeah I realized actually no one wants to hang out with me full time which was kind of yeah a, a weird one but um I strangely empathize with that quite a lot because I, I used to be extremely quiet and I only really chatted to people over like messenger and stuff yeah and but so like when i started my taekwondo stuff and i you know i started getting published in the newspaper and in the school magazine and put up in the pe department it's like people knew who i was it's yeah. just i didn't have that strong any sort of strong connection with somebody or at least i didn't feel like i did so i understand i think i understand that quite like as well sort of being like the isolated celebrity <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, yeah it is an odd one i mean um i think because yeah naturally autistic people are so you know a- a- excited and a- attached to their obsession to some degree naturally that's gonna that's gonna stand out and i think it's good that you know we're praised for our um interests and we're good that we're praised for our our kind of fascination and, and obsession with things but but also yeah it's um it can kind of all come a bit off you know a bit weird at the same time kind of thing which um yeah i mean it's it's funny like looking back at, at myself when you know I, I wasn't labeled as autistic when i was just labeled as nick it was um looking back yeah i, I can can totally see elements where yeah i was very kind of determined and very is- isolated in my own little way i guess um but yeah it is it is strange looking back um at, at scenarios knowing what you know now isn't it yeah it is like especially with just learning all the different ins and outs of autism and and to be honest the i think the main thing that really makes me reflect is go, going into schools and seeing autism in in children you know from that time that i was in that situation and just sort of viewing it from a different angle that's yeah, that's a very strange experience it's it's mm. really weird because you could if there were a te- if I was a teacher looking at myself, like I wouldn't be able to tell what the problem is. So it's kind of like when I'm at, when I'm in a class, I always try to make sure that I give each sort of kid as much attention as as the other was. The, mm. No matter if they were are doing well or bad, or just because you don't know what's under the surface, do you? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think I think that's you've hit the nail on the head there about about autism. Is it something that's so? sort of um sometimes it's it, i mean th- there obviously are elements where um autism can be very severe and, and and that kind of thing but yeah i mean especially with kind of asperger's which is kind of i mean obviously doesn't exist anymore but um yeah kind <laughs> of um yeah which which i think i think that's the one where it can really catch people out and actually you can look totally normal and you're masking it all totally well and and by the time you get around to you know coming home or something else your whole life changes it on it kind of flips on its head so yeah, I could speak for hours about school yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of thing. But yeah, it blew my neck. <laughs> so we are here 
primarily to talk about the relationship between autism and obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD as most people know it. And along with a lot of other conditions that just seem to be a link to autism. <laughs> when I was pulling, I was putting together this quiz called, called the Big Autism Quiz All right. that I sort of uh, I put on for a few Instagram advocates and stuff. And we were trying to f- figure out like a pick the wrong answer kind of question for what is comorbid with autism um, or Asperger's. And we, we couldn't find one. Like it just seems... It seems that everywhere we look, it's like everything's come over with autism, uh, which mm. is a bit strange. Yeah, I mean, the ho- it's impossible to describe, really, isn't it? It's, it's there's so many. I mean, you'd have to literally get every autistic person in in a room to be able to define it. You know, it's 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 just a total. It's like with anything, it's it's just such a massive spectrum, isn't it? Yes, and I do think that there are um, some commonalities between autism and, and OCD, you know, with the sort of repetitive uh, nature and, and the obsessions and, and all of that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think they're, they're, they're almost, there's so much of it that crosses over and there's so, so much that's, that runs parallel. I mean, it's, um, you know, autism is, is naturally about kind of being obsessive and, and kind of black and white thinking. And, and that's, that's the kind of reality of it, really, in the sense that you're either one way or the other. And, and that's, that's something that I find all the time. Like I can't do, do half, you know, I end up either putting on weight or losing weight. And that's just, just one example, you know, it's, um, yeah, me too. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's chaos. Um, <laughs> so I've never heard anyone say that before. Yeah. Oh, I do that different. all the time. It's never on a stable weight. It's always no. up and down. Yeah. So I think it's just like things like that. And like TV programs, so like this week, for example, I've been watching a lot of air crash investigation, as you do. Probably haven't seen for years, and now I'm just back addicted to it. So yeah, it's, and it, I think that's what's kind of, you know, being obsessive is, is, is at the heart of autism for me anyway. And, the, yes. you know, that, that detail and, you know, my, my big selling point when I'm kind of looking for work and stuff is that I'm, my attention to detail is, is I'd like to think, you know, kind of unparalleled. Um, yes. And yeah, when I'm, you know, watching TV shows or when I'm watching back work that we've done. Classic example on um, Bite Size recently, just just a, like a very small consistency thing where we'd written a, a URL on the screen and it was bbc.co.uk and then on the next slide it was www.bbc.co.uk. And um, uh, that, would that was eat me up. That was heartbreaking. Uh. Oh. So, I mean, that kind of thing is, is obviously <laughs> has a great advantage, but we've had a few mistakes over the, over the um, series, which I think everyone can can you know i mean nobody would notice really i don't think um they're kind of really minor mistakes which you know everyone makes minor mistakes and i'm sure in every single possible thing there's a minor mistake somewhere you know i think there's there's a lot of i mean although media is a creative thing i think there's a lot of logic and a lot of sense behind yes. everything that's that's done so it's it's great you know to have people like that in the workplace but i think i'm i'm learning um yeah kind of when to when it's a big deal and when it when it really isn't a big deal yeah, it's a balance. It's a very strange balance. I, I completely get that. I am. I do often get very obsessed about very small, minor details. But like you've told me a little bit about sort of the, I guess, more of the positive side of OCD. In what ways does it affect you negatively? Yeah, as I said, I've mentioned mentioned a lot of the positives there. But um, yeah, negatively, I mean, um, in relationships in the past and still to this day, it's um, it's difficult not to become obsessive about somebody's flaws. I think that's that's something that I'm probably going to battle with my whole life. I find it very difficult to, you know, I'm such a perfectionist that that um, I, I want the highest standards, and you're never going to you're never going to get that from someone. You know, that's that's the reality is that relationships sort of you know uh, go up and down, and um, there are okay days, and there are sort of terrible days, and there are great days, and that you know it's going up and down constantly. So you you can never work in kind of just black and white um with a relationship which i think is at the heart of um kind of relationship ocd which is is what i've experienced yeah i had had an experience a few few years ago where um i left i left my partner at the time and i i, I kind of i hadn't heard really much of about ocd or relationship ocd as, mm-hmm. as there is as well I hadn't really heard of it so i kind of then looked back on things and realized that i'd actually you know kind of left this person for for what was a, a very small and insignificant thing really 
so yeah, we ma- actually, I mean, we, we managed to rekindle things at the time and it was, it was actually all, all all right for, for a while. So it's a strange one where relationship, you know, and, and social, it, it kind of predominantly affects my, my social life, my OCD, um, uh, which I suppose some people might find strange when they think yeah. of OCD, but, um, yeah, I'm very obsessive about, about relationships, I guess that's, that's what it is. It's very intriguing because mm. it's, it's kind of like honestly like as much as much as i've sort of looked into ocd and sort of learned about it at university i I was i was sort of expecting like you know the the typical sort of negatives of not being able to go to sleep because you have to flip the light the light switch on and off but Mm. you you are like i've never heard of like relationship ocd yeah it's it's, so it's yeah it's, it's one form of it i mean um yeah, I mean, when I was younger, actually, I mean, it's funny we said, talk about light switches and stuff. And obviously, I didn't know I was anywhere near autism or OCD at this point. Yeah, I used to turn off you know, light switches a lot before I went to bed and make sure they were all off and doors locked and that kind of thing. Try and, well, it's compulsive decisions about relationships, really. And so, um, yeah, I've kind of learned what's, I'm, I'm learning what is a big deal and what, what isn't. But yeah, I mean, it's, I, I still, still, I still wonder, um, you know, because it's it's kind of real, just anxiety. Just you know, OCD is anxiety, really, at the end of the day, and it's um, it's looking at things in such great depth and such um, detail that 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 naturally it's it's going to have flaws, and so it's a very strange thing. And I think um, at that time when I, I left my partner, I ended up going into because I had no relationship to think about. I ended up with just OCD. I, I was actually on my break from university. It was kind of January where universities aren't mm-hmm. um, operating. And yeah, as I said, I was watching the news and a lot of kind of dark stories would fill my mind and kind of, kind of, yeah, graphic images. And it was, yeah, it was, it was terrible really because my mind was obsessing over, you know, really dark things, which it didn't, it was only doing because, you know, I kind of put myself into that very stressed, anxious position because of, um, you know, leaving the, the relationship really rather. So I kind of fueled the fire to some degree. Yeah. And so, yeah, it kind of ended up in a bit of a yeah depressive, obsessive uh, situation. And uh, yeah, I ended up having kind of treatment with um, kind of antidepressants and counselling and, bit, you know, bits of everything. So, yeah, I mean, um, I was lucky afterwards, as I said, that, that my, you know, my partner at the time um, kind of understood and, and we kind of rekindled things. So, yeah, it, it's, it wasn't a great situation, but I think, you know, the amount of stuff I learned on the back of that was just just incredible, really. Yeah. I'd never thought about the sort of how OCD could could affect relationships. Mm, yeah, I think I, I sort of see that a little bit in myself as well. Mm. You know, I'm not trying to take anything away from you. No, or of anything course, like that. Yeah, sometimes depending on my levels of anxiety, mm. I do sort of tend to be a bit more n- nitpicky in my own head. It's not really mm. something that I say a lot but there there is always something that i think could be better or could be changed or i guess yeah. that sort of per- perfection kind of mindset um is yeah. a little bit harmful but i've always been sort of quite st- stepped back i always try to like think things over a lot before i bring stuff up and i guess that sort of attitude to it then lends itself more to a good sort of outlook on it i guess mm. Yeah, I think I think uh, yeah, I think you're right. It's 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 good to be kind of considered, and it's good to be kind of meticulous and um, fixated with something. But it's it, yeah, it, it can also have its um, yeah negatives all at the same time. Yeah, you're right. It's um, yeah. I mean, there's there's so many misconceptions around OCD generally around kind of what yes. people think it is. I mean, the, the Wikipedia page for OCD has people someone washing their hands, which I think um, kind of <laughs> says it all. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, people people say, yeah, I'm a little OCD, and and to begin with, when I first heard that, I mean, um, yeah, I was I was kind of all right with it, but now, you know, I've I've experienced it and I've learned more about it. Yeah, it's it's strange when someone says I'm a little OCD. I think I think I'd rather they'd say a little obsessive, but um, yeah, I, I get why people say, you know, just kind of language sort of evolves to to kind of fit what's what people know and what people have heard but um so would you say there's a lot of misconceptions around ocd yeah i mean it's i i, I totally get why people say oh you know you're being a little ocd here or whatever and, and I, I get why they're using it but the actual a little ocd isn't really a thing to be fair i mean obsessive compulsive disorder is what it is yeah. it's, it's 
It's where you're totally... Um, Can't be a little bit obsessive. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's like, I don't know, it's, it's, you, yeah, it's, just, it's just impossible, really. You can be a, a little bit um, ordered and you can be a little bit kind of tidy or you can be a little bit, um, yeah, there's, there's a difference between being organized and being um, yeah. kind of, yeah, tidy. And I know somebody who has, I can't remember what it was called, but it was some sort of... Um, a perfectionist thing but it wasn't mm. it is it is like a a disorder but it's not very known about mm. um and i know someone who is quite on that perfectionist um side of things but he's not like they're not like obsessive and mm. compulsive about it it's just sort of it comes across as being a little bit controlling and mm. a little bit sort of difficult difficult to to navigate a conversation when, when mm. there's something that is needed to be done because it's like they've got a plan in their head for everything and and all that kind of stuff and i guess that that in most people's head would cross over with ocd i guess yeah i think yeah it's it's where you draw the line between being ordered and structured and clued up and things and where you're kind of organized yeah but there's a balance and there's a line between that really isn't there between where it crosses over Mm. into obsessive really well, it's it is it's a disorder because it it causes disorder in in lives, mm, mm. Uh, which I think those comments about sort of being a little bit OCD doesn't make any sense because mm. if 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 it's OCD to an amount that it's okay, it's not a disorder. Mm. I I just I just find it illogical. Like it doesn't like upset me or anything. It's just like, yeah. What do you what do you mean? What do you mean yeah. you're a bit OCD? You're not. Yeah. Like. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I mean, people who say I'm a little bit OCD might might genuinely have OCD, might they? But um, yeah, I think it's yes, just of course, um, yeah. it's kind of misinformation about it, and it's just it's just it kind of it's harmful to those who who are, are genuine, but you know, um, genuinely are, are suffering. Really, I guess like 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 in the media and and stuff, a lot a lot of the sort of uh, cases that you see on on OCD come come in the form of you know those channels where they um, highlight people who are very extreme OCD, like people who wash their hands with like bleach and and all, mm. all of and all that kind of stuff, and have to get up every ten minutes to look out the window, or else they feel like the mm. house is going to explode. We we see that sort of extreme of OCD, I guess, and we mm. don't see the sort of more. Um, I'm not going to say more common, but less, more common. Less extreme, yeah, yeah. Yeah, less extreme, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I I think, I mean, I think autism and, you know, I think OCD sits within autism, really. Um, And I think if you've got autism, you've you've got, a you know, it's all, you know, autism is about kind of obsessive and and repetitive behaviours, isn't it? So, so yeah, it's it's all consuming, really. It's all all part of the same thing, I I would say, um, in my opinion. Yeah. I think definitely I, I do have that sort of obsessive mindset, but I don't have much of the, I don't have much of the com- compulsion. It's like mm. I, I, I use obsessions and, and stuff as a, a, a form of helping my anxiety mm. and, and sort of making it so that I don't have to organize myself. If I have like a schedule or something, then I'm not constantly... Mm worried about what time it is and whether I should move on to a next thing I just have it there like yeah. just telling me what to do so in, the, in that sense it, it's more of a emotional crutch rather than a compulsion mm. I guess yeah 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 I can yeah I can relate to that it's um yeah I mean some some things you know I think I think that the, the fundamental key to, to uh, OCD is that I mean some people genuinely do have to um compulsively act but um, I think when you can you can hold your compulsions down and you can sort of say, you know, it's it's okay. Yeah, when when you're not acting on your compulsions as much, it's it's obviously much easier. But that sounds like a, such a daft thing to say. But yeah, does that make any sense? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. I think I get mm. what you mean. Like you, you feel the fire if you give in to yeah, your compulsions. Exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, I get I get that. Like. I think I think it's it's yeah. also good to sort of highlight what the disorder means, what the name means. Like obsessions mm. are things that for for anybody out there, the things that you 
think about a lot and you can't really get out of your head and compulsions are the things that you do in order to cope with those obsessions like as Mm. a so it's like a a relationship between the two one happens and so you do the other thing to make it go away kind of thing Mm. and that's the sort of like base understanding of it i guess Mm. but then obviously as you said it's it can be a lot more complicated than that Mm. can sort of um influence your your life in different ways depending on the person yeah i mean there's there's, there's so many different uh ways it can kind of um yeah kind of uh come on so you know i mean there's like you know skin picking is it could be described as obsessive or biting your nails and and that that kind of you know those those sort of things also come into it so there's it's such a big yeah again a, a big spectrum really that that has so much so much to it really and yeah people people might have ocd and they might not realize so i mean you know, I always say that the more you know about yourself, the better, really. Yeah, I think pe- people are scared of of putting labels on, on the, because they see it as like labeling themselves, and it's it's either they, they're, they're afraid that people are going to look in and think, ah, you know, got OCD, you've lived for your life, you don't need to get this diagnosis, you're doing fine, kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. Or it's like people will think that you're trying to get like attention or trying to be part of like a air quotation mark special group or Mm. being different and stuff and i think there's a lot of difficulty around that for people like Mm. you don't want to come across as garnering attention it's it's like i think understanding yourself is quite important i think like it it is strange because when i've come across people um who aren't autistic but do have some aspects of ocd it does it is sometimes hard for me to distinguish the the sort of superficial traits, I suppose, mm-hmm. to an extent, because I, I guess OCD comes with anxiety a lot of the time. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. There's so many. I mean, autism. I you know, I believe is just a connection of a uh, kind of list. You know, a list of um, symptoms essentially that that make up autism. And um, OCD is is similar. And there's there's kind of attributes that kind of mirror across a lot of things so um superficially it looks quite yeah, similar yeah it, it, it looks similar but you know everything sort of slightly overlaps i guess hmm. so what sort of strategies and treatments do you use to cope with these sort of ocd related symptoms yeah i mean um i mean i, I try and stay on um i try and speak to a counselor as much as much as i can really um and try and I mean, I think the first thing of, of overcoming anything is that you've got to be open-minded and you've got to be, um, you know, receptive to to help and um, you know, willing to listen. Really, I think that's that's number one um, for any sort of treatment for for anything really. So that's that's something I do uh, I do a lot of. Antidepressants, I think, are are important to to things as well. I think um, I think there seems sometimes a bit so of a treatment for OCD. Yeah, OCD. Yeah. So so you, yeah, there's there's. There are there are yeah drugs which can can change the the brain to be less. I mean I'm not a scientist, um, but yeah can <laughs> can help with the effects of it anyway. Um, so so that's that's something as I say that I've um, I've used um, before. But yeah, I think it has to be a mix of everything really. I think it has to be a mix of yeah kind of um, self you know talking therapies and and um, antidepressants have helped as well. So I think. That's kind of how I uh, manage it, but yeah, I mean, there, there are there are moments where it feels like I'm becoming too obsessive about this, and how how do you how do you stop that? How how do you stop the, the slide? If that makes sense? Um, yeah, because I guess like what, what you can get obsessed as well about trying to fix it as well. Mm, yeah, and sort of drive up your anxiety about it. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, um, yeah, I, I mean, I've learned making rash decisions is 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 daft now. And and making big decisions quickly is is not a good idea. It's kind of how I approach things these days, I guess. So I mean, um, yeah, if if some you know if, if my relationship's struggling or if I'm becoming too obsessive about one particular detail of it, then I try and step away before before making any rash decisions. But then that that kind of naturally leads you into a position where you're just very emotionally fueled. Yeah, exactly. And you can just hold off making decisions. And just not make them, if that makes sense. And sometimes decisions yeah. do have to be made. So sometimes I'm a bit too cautious, you know, and, and um, 
now I've sort of gone the other way. And that's the thing is you're always sort of going from one end to the other and there's no, never any in between. I don't, I don't think. Um, trying to find that middle ground. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, I think that's it. And like, I always try and say that I'm not, not great at dealing with change because it's, you know, totally throws all the scales off completely. And, um, and actually my, my counselor said to me the other day that, um, you know, you've proved that you, you are actually quite good at dealing with change. And, um, yeah, you know, you, coped with going to university you've coped getting a job you've coped with the you know the virus crisis you know so there's this i think it's just giving yourself more credit sometimes isn't it and um i think that's that's something i've, I've learned with ocd is that yeah even if you do make a decision you, you'll you've coped before so you'll cope again kind of thing but um it's it's kind of yeah just becoming more making more rational decisions and, and I, you know i've found over the last month or so I, well I, what i've started doing is started like doing a little daily journal of kind of what, what goes on. Mm. And um, sometimes I've just kind of updating on what's happened in the day, but yeah, a journal and, and a diary as itself has, has had massive effects for me over the last month or so, just, just writing things down and, and kind of gathering evidence really um, for, for future decisions, I guess. And that, that's, that's a hundred percent. It is that if you can work out how your how you work and how, and what your kind of triggers are and what you, what kind of can, um, upset you and what can also work for you is, is really really important so I think for any autistic person it's just self-improvement and, and that that you, you know you should put your obsession into to learning really rather than as anything else if you can yeah I think journaling and writing sort of jotting down things that happen or things that you've um, realized about yourself or others or interactions can be a very potent tool for improving yourself and mm. pulling up any sort of deficits that you have. Mm. I found that that in combination with reading and, and sort of get gathering experience from life mm. <clears throat> is, is the way that I sort of improve my s social skills and my yeah. um, executive functioning and, mm. and all that kind of stuff. And it's, I think there's there's a common misconception that as you get older, you get more mature. Mm. Whereas it's 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 really not like that. It the, the amount of maturity that you gain is very dependent on how much actionable work you do. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah, you're right. I think it's it is just just learning and and being open to things. And you know, I remember when I was young, I had so many instances where I was just so single minded and, and didn't listen to anyone and i think listening yeah. is just one of the most critical things and um you know i think i think that's why in any relationship isn't it it's, it's communication and and in any any area of life you know it's all it's all communication and, and that's um the, the more knowledge you have about a subject the better you're going to react so i think so yeah as i said writing stuff down for me is, is proved proved invaluable really because you know i can i can then search you know obsessions or or, or something like that or yeah, just anything in my diary because I've tagged them all um, and, and see what I last did on that subject, if that makes sense. So it's like having a little journal as to your, your life, you know. Um, so that, that would be my advice to anybody who, who might, be, might be struggling. Would you say that sort of in a, in a scenario where you've spent a lot, your whole day at work and then you've, you've got like a social gathering and you, your social battery is very low, do you think that that those that sort of expenditure makes you more vul vulnerable to that sort of OCD tendency. Yeah, I suspect when you're tired and you've you've had a long day or, or something like that, that you can become more obsessive. But in my experience, I think when I'm working, because I'm obsessive, actually, you know, and because I'm working hard and and that's that's satisfying. You know, it's the satisfaction I think that 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 takes the energy out of of the fire, if that makes sense. You know, it, it's. Yeah. It can be um, exa exhausting during the day, um, but if if you're satisfied by it and it's everything's working well and um, everything's working as planned, it can be incredibly satisfying and incredibly rewarding. So, in that sense, um, you know, I, I don't find work sometimes work can be tiring, but but on the whole, I'd say it's it's it takes the the energy out of of what would be a a day where I'd just be be thinking and wondering and and stuck in my own head for most of the day. So distraction is is a very important thing for me and like um so I'm, I'm actually i've actually got a few days off this week so i've got um i've had yesterday off and today and 
uh, and the weekend as How well. How is that for and, you? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yesterday was was okay because you know I I woke up late and you know I just kind of enjoyed kind of catching up on things that I you know wanted to catch up on. But then today I knew, knew that I needed to do something productive, you know. So so yeah, it was yeah I've been working on my website and I've been um, trying to you know uh, obviously t- talk to you and um, try and you know actually be productive with my day and that that's the thing that that's most satisfying for me is is being being productive really yeah and and getting things done and um yeah i mean sometimes i'll i'll be knackered but i think my ability to keep going when i've when i've got a you know when when i've got momentum yeah exactly is 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 great so um it does have its benefits yeah i get that to to some extent because if i've got an idea of how how the day is going to go and what i'm going to produce and how productive i'm going to be if there are any things in my day that don't go to plan in my head it can usually quite heavily affect my mood on the night but if everything goes perfectly and every i do everything that i need to do and sometimes even before you know sort of my allotted time my confidence and my anxiety is low and i feel great and i can relax but if if i if it doesn't go to plan then i'll just i'll have to keep working on it into the evening because if i don't then i feel bad about myself yeah yeah no i, t- I totally get that i think um there's a massive massive element of of determination and, and resilience that you men- mentioned earlier in, in, in kind of carrying on and i think that element where yeah you have you know mass- masses of determination masses of of inclination to get things done but um what can be dangerous is that i guess at the end of the yeah at the end of the road when you when you're losing all your energy you you kind of kind of collapse and Crash. end up more more frustrated yeah we have talked a little bit about the sort of interplay between autism and ocd hmm. and and sort of what makes someone lean towards sort of an ocd like tendency it does it does seem from the the statistics online that anxiety seems to be the biggest comorbid thing with autism and I, f- I know that anxiety can interplay with with OCD as well, so it's 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 weird looking mm. at those st- statistics. I feel like if you did like a what do you call it like a Venn Venn diagram where you not a Venn diagram? Oh yeah, yeah Venn diagram. They have circles overlapping yeah. and stuff, and yeah, 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 that's the one. I feel like there'd be a, if we were to plot every single sort of <laughs> diagnosis down, I think autism would sort of be the biggest circle there. Mm. Um, sort of tie things in yeah, together. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, I think I think there's, there's you know a lot of things sit within each other, and yeah, it's um, there'd be a lot. Yeah, there'd be certainly a lot going on in in the autism circle. I would imagine um, in terms of things. That, yeah, things that make it up. Yeah, and I think may, maybe autism and, and OCD is is comorbid, or maybe autism is comorbid with anxiety, and maybe that's. That anxiety makes someone more susceptible to things like OCD and depression and and stuff like that. Yeah. It's just not something that anyone's sort of gone down in the rabbit hole kind of with. It's it's yeah. always been yeah. this is what the statistics show. Therefore, you're more likely for this. It's yeah. never like um, delved into the the intricacies of it. I suppose but it's all very very yeah. interesting. Let's t- let's talk. Go back to the documentary a little bit because obviously, like. Mm. If I've, I've sort of over the past um, couple of weeks I've been getting in contact with uh, different interviewees to try and get them onto the podcast because I feel like although I tried my very best to represent people's opinions and views in the documentary as, as I said like I, I cut it down a massive amount and I've got a lot of different chunks of opinions some some more than others and uh, I really wanted to to get you onto the podcast and sort of give people an idea of your views more more in depth because I think every story is different from what I gathered from the interviews. So it's very mm. interesting. Yeah, probably in the last two years, I was all very um, positive about autism, and I was very, um, you know, after I was diagnosed, I was very, very kind of let's shout about the positives yeah. and, and that kind of thing, but. Um, I don't know, maybe it's just now that it's kind of settled down and I've kind of worked out what my reality is that perhaps I'm slightly more not as 
helpful sometimes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think I've realistic. become naturally a bit more, yeah, more realistic and more maybe a little bit more negative about about how it you know affects my life. But um, I think it yeah genuinely just depends which what mood I'm in or what what I'm going through is that is kind of my view on on autism. But I think when I think about it rationally, I think there's there's so many you know positives to it, and I certainly wouldn't have had the exciting life I've had had now you know with with work and, and my career and stuff so yeah i think you know I, I do look look at it as i'm very lucky to have this you know this mindset that that makes me obsessive and has made me made me achieve things so um yeah i think there's there's negatives to it that you know um i continue to find out every day but there are a lot of positives to it as well people either take um one of two stances when they sort of get their diagnosis it's either autism is horrible and er everything about it is is terrible or it's oh wow look look how many there's so many people who have so many similarities with me it's great and look at all the things that it can do and i think i think you can either take either to one of those uh, mindsets to it i yeah. guess my mindset was more on the negative side i guess maybe it depends as I, as I said earlier, yeah, I, I met this person when I was doing my final project at university, which was a, a radio documentary about this this guy who was autistic, and yeah, he was diagnosed when he was like eight or, or, or something like that. Which mm -hmm. for me, I, I can't comprehend because you know ultimately you'd, you'd have so much more awareness, but also potential like sort of self doubt and um, you know, kind of I'm losing my you words. You can't be sort of like mindfully. Uh, mindlessly oblivious to it exactly yeah and you're going to consider it more and and that might lead you down more of a, a dangerous path i guess but um yeah i think i think as i said to you earlier there's there's an element where you've got to try and teach kids that although you're autistic it's that's just a part of you and there's there's so many positives that can come from it as well and i think i think that's it yeah is to try and try and not crush their self self morale from an early age um which can sometimes sometimes happen yeah and i think i think there are some downsides and upsides to early and late diagnosis like i think a lot of us see see early diagnosis as like a a complete gift like there's nothing wrong about it but i guess if i wasn't diagnosed with with autism i wouldn't sort of attribute my struggles to it as much whereas it's like yeah. i used to when it, when I had like a breakdown or a meltdown, I sort of you know asked my mom like, why am I autistic? Like, why why am I born this way? And whereas I, I think I, I'd probably had a tiny bit more support than most people going through the education system. Not a massive amount though. Yeah, school can can be such a tough time anyway. And so to add autism into the mix, and there's this yeah, I suppose there's always this debate about whether you you put your child into a, a school that that might be more catered towards them or you just let them integrate with with life i guess and, and work the way own way out but i, I suppose it depends on every single ch child's needs and um you know now now asperger's fall under autism and, and it's a kind of greater spectrum I, I i guess i suppose there's more scenarios that that may occur that may have different results yeah one thing that is common is that the the way of living life for an autistic person is not common for, between people mm. <laughs> like one thing that works for someone yeah. else might not work for them and early diagnosis for one person might be terrible or late diagnosis and that's the thing i mean there's so many so many different experiences of of autism and you know you see so many you know there's, it's good that there's more in the media nowadays i mean there's there's plenty of programs out there that are, are showing the various sides of it but i think um yeah, it's it's considered. I mean, most of the characters I see on TV or or that kind of thing are, are more female um, around. Uh, sorry, are more male, mm. and and you don't see enough um, female yes. um, people who are autistic, which is as obviously a thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, so that the narrative around autism needs to needs to evolve really into it's not just um, not just men; it's women as well, and um, it's not not sort of. Um attributed just to one race or yeah exactly and it's it's trying to paint a giant you know a bigger rainbow really that that cater, you know caters to everyone rather than just kind of 
paint a, a kind of very linear view of, of things. So yeah, I think the, the more experiences that go out there, the better really. But um, yeah, I, you know, it, it, you know, it's a fact that there's more um, men diagnosed with, with autism, but I think that's because it was, it was kind of easier to pick up on. Yeah, exactly. And probably I think at most of the evidence at the start was probably from, from men. So yeah, I think it's, you know, it's never evolving thing, I think. And, you know, I'm sure the, um, you know, the, the symptoms that make up autism will, will continue to kind of evolve and, and, and kind of develop as, as more research goes on. So, you know, I think it, it's good that it's out there and it's good that we've got stuff like autism awareness week. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's the role of the, the media really to, to kind mm. of paint a, a bigger, bigger picture of autism really. So yeah, great. We've, we've talked about the documentary and a bit about autism and, and OCD and the crossovers. Would you like to give us three main takeaway points that you want people to remember? Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, I think number one would be continue to ask for help when you need it. I think that's a, I think that's said a lot at the moment, but it's just, it's just so true that I think even if you're, you, you know, like this morning, I woke up really early and didn't, didn't feel great. And I just went for a walk and I spoke to my mum and that, that changed, changed things, you know, um, significantly. So yeah, I think never be afraid to, to chat to somebody. I think probably pursue your dreams, I guess. So if you've got an ambition, if you've got something, just go for it. And, and it kind of leads me back to my point earlier is that if you want it bad enough, you'll, you'll get there. And I know these are all kind of very cliche sort of things, but, um, yeah, this is, this is kind of where, where I, what I'd say. Um, and then third point, yeah, just listen, I guess, try and expand your knowledge, I guess. And that's something that, yeah, I suppose I've discovered during this little chat. I think I need to do more of is just try and read more and, and learn more and, um, yeah, try not to get too complacent that you're, that you're, you're fine in, in dealing with things on your own because no, nobody, yeah, nobody can face face life alone really it's it's you know you've got to you've got to talk to others and you've got to find out experiences and you've got to try and learn and and that's the only way you'll you'll live a happy-ish life I guess is is if you kind of open your mind I guess and um yeah I, I, I suppose it's, it just comes down to kind of respect and and trying to learn um again learn as, as much as you can but yeah those those would be my three points so so yeah I definitely uh agree with you on that on that last one especially like Mm. even even if you do feel like you can get through anything there's only there's only so much that you can tackle at one time and obviously if mm. you've got like a job that's quite demanding like you've got it's going to be difficult to fit in all of that stuff isn't it is is yeah yeah i think um you you you, you do i think i think you, you can always find a new rhythm um quite quickly i found i think Yes, well, yes, the aut- autistic people might struggle with change, but actually, we like our routines. And actually, once we've found something that works, we can stick to it, and we can. But I think it's just it's trying to find a balance of not being too afraid to change, but also sort of accept your ways of working. I guess everything's a balancing act. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a balancing act, and we don't we don't do balance. We do one way or the other, which is kind of the problem. Yeah, but yeah. So let's move on to the last question which is always an open question, so you can respond in any way you want, which I know is probably not helpful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what does autism mean to you, Nick? Yeah, hmm. let me have a little think. I mean, there's been, uh, there's been a lot of open-ended questions here. Well, I usually I struggle with, uh, with questions but like that. But no, um, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a talent that is ultimately not given the light of day sometimes and i think um autism has, has so many good stories behind it and so many talents and so many skills that could be of use in this world and often they get overlooked because you know because somebody can't communicate or somebody um finds things difficult and you know alan Turing, who was who was suspected to have, have had autism on, on some level he you know he, he helped change the the face of the the second world war so i think you know there's so much that can be uncovered by um, investing in aut- uh, autistic people and trying to trying to give them uh, a bit more respect and a bit more uh, a few more opportunities and um, I think yes things will go wrong and yes autistic people might not do things as you'd expect but ultimately if you invest in them um, then then things will things will come off and you know um, I think back to that lady who 
help me at this this charity who um I still still keep in contact with and yeah without without her investing in me she didn't know I was autistic at the time but um <laughs> she knew probably there was something different about me and you know just investing in in people I think is is something that I think is is really important to to autism and and showing them respect and time and patience is 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 critical to kind of opening up their um skills and and also potentially um you know getting some some rewards to yourself so yeah that that's kind of what it means to me and i suppose that's the most most important thing is is just trying to be open minded and and kind of show autistic people that there is a is a place for them in the world brilliant thank you very much for that nick so would you like to give out some of your links um to like your website and stuff yeah i mean people are always always willing to uh, people are always I'll start again. People are always uh, have. Uh, heck, what am I trying to say? <laughs> uh, people can always go to my website, which is uh, nickransom.co.uk, which has all my um, kind of portfolio on of what I've been up to. And, and I actually did a video on autism um, or Asperger's, as, as I described it, then it's right after my diagnosis. And, and that sits on my website. And uh, yeah, initially I was a bit kind of apprehensive about putting that on my website kind of professionally. But um, the, the number of people that view it and, and then see something different about me is 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 a very positive thing so there's there's that um i'm on twitter as well mr nick ransom uh but yeah there's the those are the two main ones i'd say mm-hmm. and on the website you've got a lot of the stuff that you've done and it's very cl- mm. I'm, I'm currently having a little bit of a a click through it's for oh a little click through yeah i just had just had one of your videos just just pop up in my ears i oh, just started playing yeah <laughs> I am. Um, it, it's a very good website. Nitty, I've had sort of like a nitty gritty thing today where it's, I'm trying to subtitle my mm. documentary, but the, the YouTube interface for subtitling is mm. just so slow. And, oh, and so oh my goodness. I've t- I typed it all up and that was easy, but now I have to like mess around with the timings and oh my goodness. it's just well, awful. So it's funny. 40 minutes long as well. Oh. Wow, I'll, I'll pray for you because I mean, um, I've actually had to do a lot of this at work actually for the for the BBC. Is is yeah, it can transcribe. They have this piece of software where it can transcribe it fairly well, and you can get it in a uh, as a transcript, I guess. And then um, yeah, trying to sort out the timings and make sure it cuts to the right point is just an an absolute nightmare. And I, I'm, you know, I think that's that. This is this is you know a, sp- a serious point to some degree, though, in the sense that you know systems should be evolved and uh, should should have evolved enough now to be able to to make subtitles, you know, easy enough. And for people who are, 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 are deaf, it's, you know, it's a really important thing. And I've actually got a, f- a friend who's, um, who suffers with, yeah, hearing loss. And, um, you know, I look at how many programs there are that either don't have subtitles or are badly subtitled and, you know, it can make a massive difference to somebody. So, so yeah, it's great that you're doing that. I've got a few people who want to sort of contribute to it as well. So I'm going to be able to get Quite quite a multi- multitude of languages subtitled on that. Oh, so nice. make it as accessible to everybody nice. as possible. Might be a bit of a task, but we'll see how that goes. I think that's pretty much all of the questions that I wanted to ask you, actually. It definitely is all the questions. Cool. <laughs> um, cool. If you want to listen to the 40 Audio podcast on any different websites you can always find it on youtube apple podcasts and spotify obviously if you want to check out more of nick's stuff um, i'll put all the stuff down in the description that he wants me to put on and if you want to check out some more content that i produce over on youtube i've got a lot of behind the scenes videos coming out on the youtube channel asperger's growth and on the website aspergersinsociety.com and if you want to get in contact with me for any sort of, uh, whether you want to share a story or you just want to, you want to come on and chat about something that you are interested in quite a lot, then please let me know at aspergesgrowth at gmail.com. Thank you very much, Nick, for coming on. Have you enjoyed the experience? Yeah, it's been good. I'm a bit knackered now. Though, no, I understand. But, um, um, but no, uh, it's been good. Good to be a part of it, and we've. Um, it's great that you're, you're continuing to represent the the autistic community. So um, yeah, keep at it. It's a bit weird, isn't it? That the, there is always a sort of trend with doing podcasting. It's the first twenty minutes yeah. is, a, is a bit sort of anxiety provoking, but then 
you, you get into it and you chill out a bit yeah. more and then you forget that you're podcasting and then <laughs> and then afterwards yeah, exactly. you, you've got that sort of mark around an hour and a quarter and then you start to feel a bit mm. drained um <laughs> yeah exactly i'm, I'm I think you've, <laughs> I think you might have to cut out a few bits that I've, uh, where I've just rambled and tried to find some words. But um, yeah, uh, that's probably a, maybe an, an hour worth of decent stuff there. I don't know. You'll have to see. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm always very appreciative of anyone coming on. So it's um, I'm, I'm thank you for that's coming cool. On. Been good fun. So thank you everybody for tuning in to another episode of the Forty Auto Podcast. We've got a lot of episodes racking up, and um, I'm looking forward to interviewing some more guests in the future. Anyways, thank you for all the support with the documentary, with the YouTube channel, with all of this. And I'll see you in the next episode of the 40 OT podcast. See you later, folks. Yeah, that's cool. (laughs) Goodbye.